Good morning. It's good to see each of you here today, and it's great to be able to um, come together and worship the Lord. This morning we're in Mark chapter 7, and I'd invite you to turn with me to Mark chapter 7. I'd like to read a few of the verses that are here in the red letters, that is the words that Jesus said uh, here in Mark chapter 7, and I'd ask you to stand with me please as I read a few of these verses for us today. I'll be starting here in verse 6. Um, Brian Pohlmeyer was uh, able to teach the ABF, appreciated that. He was in Mark chapter 12, so you probably didn't realize that we're in a series in the book of Mark, so we're very consistent. So if you were here, you heard him teach. He did a great job in Mark chapter 12. Here in this chapter, in Mark chapter 7, we have uh, an accusation that comes uh, against Jesus and his disciples uh, for not uh, doing the ritual and the purification uh, cleaning themselves up, uh, their hands in the hand washing prior to eating. And Jesus says, Rightly did Isaiah prophesy of you hypocrites, as it is written, uh, This people honors me with their lips, but their heart is far away from me. But in vain do they worship me, uh, teaching as doctrines the precepts of men. Neglecting the commandment of God, you hold to the tradition of men, is Jesus' reply. Father, we thank you that we have the word of God. Help us, Lord, to cling to your holy word, the scriptures. Help us, Father, to lift them high, and may we see the sufficiency of scripture in all things. Help us, Father, to avoid lifting up the teachings of men. Help us, Father, to focus on our hearts, which are the true issues of life. Father, help us today to understand this passage, to grasp it in its entirety, so that we might be able to grow as followers of our Savior, Jesus Christ. For it's in his name we pray, amen. You may be seated, please. Thank you for standing. Well, it's good to be back with you here this morning. Uh, it's been about three weeks since uh, uh, I was here speaking. Um, if you count the, the days in between, two Sundays, I guess. Last Sunday was fantastic. We had a great time here. Sunday before that, we were, Karen and I were up, on, uh, uh, up in Cape Cod uh, where I grew up. And it's interesting, um, I had the opportunity to bike there, and I biked uh, over 150 miles. And on one of my bike rides, I came to a beach that I'd actually never been to before, even though I grew up there as a kid and went back there for vacations. And it was um, the most beautiful beach. It was just wonderful. I stood up on this bluff about 200, it was into the parking lot because it's been eroded over time. But you look down about 200 feet down and it's just crystal clear. Everything's clean and wonderful. And I looked up the beach and there were no people. And I looked the other way and I saw two people and I thought, this is a really, really neat beach. There was only one problem. There's this ginormous sign at the end of the uh, parking lot and it said that you need to be shark smart. So I, I did what every good bicyclist does. I whipped my phone out, took a picture, sent it to the kids and said, isn't this really cool, you know? And um, I got back home at the end of my bike ride and I said to Karen, we're going to go to a new beach, a new, a new beach. I said, I've never been there before, but it's just so beautiful. There's hardly anyone there. And so we, we got to the beach in the afternoon and it was a hot day. It's 85 degrees and it's just brutally hot for Cape Cod. And uh, I thought to myself, I, I, I really didn't plan to go in the water. You know what I mean? My dad was on the Indianapolis, and, and you know how all the men there died with the sharks. And, and dad didn't get eaten by a shark. And he purposed in his heart not to be eaten by a shark. And I have followed suit with that thought. So we, we, we went there and we put the umbrella up and I sat in the beach chair. And then it was too hot and I had to go in the water a little bit. You know how that is? And the water temperature is usually numbing and it wasn't that bad and so I went in a little further and I'm watching these people body surf and I'm thinking to myself, as long as I don't go out as far as them, right? I mean, any great white, I mean, you should have seen the picture. I'll show it to you sometime. The picture of this great white on this billboard was really intimidating. And the next thing I know, I'm swimming up to my waist and... Next thing I know, I'm up to here. 
but I'm still not the farthest guy out, <laughs> right? And my son said to me after where it was done, he said, Dad, didn't you read the sign you sent me the picture of? You're not supposed to go in over your waist. And I thought to myself, huh, I should have probably read that, right? I mean, I, I, you know, I sent the picture, but I didn't really read the information. Next thing you know, we're body surfing, and Karen and I are in there, and two days later, I was back, and I was swimming again, and, and it was great, and a few days later, there was news that a 26-year-old young man was attacked by a great white wealthy beach, and he didn't live. And I thought to myself, isn't it amazing? It's just like the scriptures. We know where the scriptures start and end, right? I mean, here it is, and God gives his, his instruction to us, and we know what we should be doing. It's, it's not that he didn't know that there were sharks there. There was a huge sign. I've seen them. I've heard about this. Only three weeks before that, a, a man just nearby there had been attacked, and he's still in the hospital. And I'm thinking to myself, how is it that we wade into these things? And the next thing you know, we're up over our heads. It doesn't happen all at once, does it? It's just kind of subtle. It kind of, you get there and you say to yourself, why am I standing here in this deep of water? For the Pharisees and the Sadducees, the scribes, there had been a process over time that had allowed them to come to the point where the oral traditions were raised up and they weren't just equal with the word of God, but they had come to take a preeminent position over the word of God. It didn't happen all at once. Uh, they come, they make this accusation, but it didn't happen all at once that they arrived at this place. They had started this oral tradition for good reason. They were in Babylon, for instance, during the captivity, and so it made sense. Let's, let's write down what we know. We don't know if we're ever going to leave here. We don't know if we're, because God had told them they would leave, but they didn't really take that to heart, but they're trying to figure out, well, maybe this is a good idea. And sooner than later, uh, as time went on, the compilation of all of these writings began to take its own form of life, so to speak. They were written down in the Mishnah. By the end of the second century, you, you have all of these oral traditions. Uh, there was the rabbi's commentary uh, on the word of God, the Gemara, and that was very preeminent. They put the Mishnah together with the Gemara, and you come up with the Talmud. You've probably heard of the Talmud. Thousands, literally thousands of pages of extra-biblical writings and regulations. Let's look at verse 1, and we'll see where this all was leading. The Pharisees and some of the scribes gathered around Jesus when they had come from Jerusalem and seen that some of his disciples were eating their bread with impure hands, that is, they were unwashed. You see, let me just give you a little bit of a backdrop here. John chapter 6, I believe, is going to tell us, um, and it might be some, a couple other chapters there too, we put the pieces together, we realize that this takes place about one year prior to the crucifixion. So this has been building up. The Pharisees have already determined that Jesus has to go. It was just a question of how, when, and where the opportunity was going to present itself. They were on a mission to take his life. And you may recall that this is going to happen right on the heels of the feeding of the thousands. And do you remember what the reaction of the people was towards Jesus after he fed the 5,000 there on the banks of the Galilee, uh, Sea of Galilee? What was their reaction? They wanted to make him king. And so because of that, the, the religious leaders needed to walk this back. They needed to go after some aspect of Jesus' ministry to slow this train down. And so they're going to come to something that is very, very important to them, and that is their hand-washing prior to their taking of bread. The first point this morning is that the accusation of violating God's standard was made by the Pharisees. If you want to take a note, Leviticus chapter 22, verses 6 and 7, tells us that the priests were instructed to do this hand-washing as part of a ceremony. 
And yet, we would look at that passage and we would understand that the people were never pressed upon to keep the same regulation as the priests. The Pharisees and some of the early rabbis had determined that all the people needed to keep this hand washing because they were all part of the the overall uh, body because they were hearing the rabbis teachings because the rabbis were teaching you were hearing now you had to somehow uh, abide by the same regulations as the priests it's kind of an interesting way to do it their accusation is that we're looking at the disciples they're eating their bread with impure hands when the grandkids are visiting they always wash their hands because mama has done such a good job of teaching them to wash their hands before they eat. And little Ryan would say, uh, Cappy, listen, uh, mama tells me I have to wash the backs of my hands too. And I said, that's very good, that's very good. So he wants to have clean hands when he eats his food. This was not so much about cleanliness as it was about a ritual purification. And I want you to connect the dots here, so I want to be really careful because Jesus soon is going to teach on the subject of of the heart and what defiles a man. What they were saying was that if you took and ate food that had not been touched with clean hands, purified hands, then the food would be defiled and the food would go into your body and thereby defile you. Do you understand that? Are you with me? So you wanted to eat food with hands that had been purified so that the food that you ate would not defile your inner man. That was the problem. In their mind, that's what it was all about. And this is exactly what Jesus here is going to address. I want to show you a short video um, because this hand washing is very, very important to the Jewish people. And I'm going to show you a video of uh, the rabbi in the synagogue who is teaching on this, and it's contemporary. It's today's teaching. For our discussion of how to wash our hands for bread. If a person's going to be having bread, then they need to wash their hands. Now, if they're having less than a, a egg's worth, in other words, if you're having less than, let's say, two pieces of bread, you should probably wash without a bracha. If you're having, uh, if you're, if you're going to wash, so you, uh, and you're going to make a bracha, then you should have a significant amount of bread, as in egg's worth uh, of bread. If your ring has a stone in it, then you definitely need to remove it. Now, as we, dis- as we demonstrate, I will be talking of course, usually you don't talk when you wash your hands. It's particularly important not to talk from the time you begin the washing until the blessing is made. Never do we interrupt between a mitzvah and its blessing. Let's say you blow the shofar, and then you, you make a bracha before the blowing of the shofar. You never interrupt in between those two things. Afterwards, it's also important not to interrupt between the washing and the eating bread. But that's actually less significant. The main thing is not to interrupt between the washing and the making of the blessing. Should you interrupt at that point, that could be a serious problem. If if by mistake you talk after you wash your hands, as long as you haven't totally removed your your mind from the idea of washing and remaining pure, then you do not need to recite the blessing again. So if we want to put the water on our hands, we want it to cover all the way from our wrist, all the way to the uh, very ends of the fingertips. In order to do that, we're going to need a significant amount of water. So it's good to fill up a nice big cup. If you use a small cup, this is going to be very difficult uh, to do. If you're in a shortage of water, you could follow a more lenient position of covering just simply up to the knuckles. So we do it as follows. You hold the hand this way so that everything is exposed. Your hand is totally exposed to the water. And you pour it twice. Hand is completely covered with water. Then we would take the towel, hold our hands up, and say, Baruch Atah Hashem Elokeinu Melech Olam Asher Kishanu Mitzvotav Vitzivanu Al Netzilat Yadaim. 
and then we dry the hands. You do not make a blessing while you're drying your hands. That wouldn't be proper. You should focus on the blessing. You shouldn't make a blessing uh, after you dry your hands, because then it's completely over. Rather, you should make the blessing before you dry your hands. You also try to hold the hands up, so that if there is any water, it falls down on your wrist, and not the other way around. The water from your, above your wrist is impure, and you wouldn't want it to fall below the wrist, and then to fall uh, uh, on top of the wrist. That would be improper. So we want to keep the hands up when we're drying our hands. I wanted you to see, though, this morning how significant and how serious this is all taken. It's not something that is just um, haphazardly addressed. There are all types of regulations that go along with this today. And this was certainly not unusual back in Jesus' day for the same type of teaching was going on. And so you had all of these different regulations, and the people were expected to know and understand all of these things. When you're supposed to talk, when you're not supposed to talk, uh, all of those little things. If your ring has a stone in it, you have to take it off, and if not, I guess you can leave it on. And this is a serious problem if you end up, you get the idea. So here we are. We find ourselves here in Mark chapter 7, and they're coming to, to Jesus' disciples, and they're chastising them and asking the question, why do your disciples not walk according to the tradition of the elders, but eat their bread with impure hands? And this is the backdrop now of Jesus' response to them, uh, speaking here about the heart condition of of these people. The articulation of Jesus is seen here as he articulates the true standard of righteousness. We see it in Isaiah chapter 29, for this is the quote that Jesus makes. Then the Lord said, this people draw near with their words, and they honor me with their lip service, but they remove their hearts far from me, and their reverence for me consists of tradition learned. This was the issue at hand. Jesus had called out the religious leaders on a number of occasions. You might think back to Matthew chapter 23, verses 27 and 28, when Jesus says, woe to you, scribes and Pharisees. Hypocrites, he says. This is exactly what he just says here. Rightly did the Isaiah prophesy of you hypocrites. Jesus is being very careful to point out that there is a, a, a great deal of hypocrisy here among those who are focused on those things that are external. When Jesus says in Matthew 23, woe to you scribes and Pharisees, you're like whitewashed tombs, which on the outside appear beautiful, but inside are full of dead man's bones and uncleanness. He's making a key, key point. He is saying, basically, you are focused on the wrong thing. Those alabaster-covered tombs that were whitewashed were so beautiful and so evident on the hillside when the sun would shine on them, you couldn't miss them. But as pretty as they were on the outside, if you looked on the inside, Jesus says, on the inside are these dead man's bones. That's what's housed in that tomb. And if you go there and you touch that, you will be made unclean. These people were focused on the wrong thing. Well, Jesus doesn't just answer them, but he makes the statement, notice there, you're neglecting the commandment of God and you hold to the tradition of men. This was their MO. They had taken that oral tradition, it had become what they were about. And what Jesus wants to do is he wants to steer them from the external and point them to the heart. It is a, a very dangerous slope to be on when you're elevating the tradition of men and especially when you make it equal with the Word of God. I think of some of the Catholic doctrines, uh, people don't realize many of them were established much later than when the Catholic Church was first established. For instance, 1414 is when the doctrine of purgatory came into effect. 
The seven sacraments weren't uh, part of the plan officially until 1439. But the most significant is in the 1500s when at the Council of Trent, they declared that the tradition of the Catholic Church is equal with the Bible. Wow. You and I tend to be careful. We try to elevate the scriptures, and rightfully so. Jesus makes the accusation here when he says that you are, notice there in verse 9, you are experts at setting aside the commandment of God in order to keep your tradition. They were skillfully handling their traditions. And this charge by Jesus was indignantly denied each and every time. In fact, it's interesting when you stop and you think about the religious leaders because everyone always has an explanation, right? Everyone has an explanation. So their explanation and their reasoning went like this. We have the, the law. We know that that is important to us. And so what we're going to do is we're going to put up a fence around the law so that we never come in and violate the law. So as long as we have these fences up that we've put there, we're safer than if the fences weren't there. The problem is, over time, the fences became what was important. The fences became more important than what they were protecting. Anytime you go to a Bible-preaching church, but every Bible preaching church will tell you that the scripture is sufficient and it is the final authority for the church, right? I mean, nobody would ever say, well, some of our traditions are just as important. But in practicality, there are many places where the traditions of a church have actually become more significant than the word of God. And we have to be very, very careful to maintain a distinction between certain traditions that may not all be bad and the elevated position of the Word of God. And hopefully you agree with that because this is, this is the importance here because it's going to bring us around to what is really significant in God's mind. Now Jesus is going to give us an illustration and he's going to tell them, he says, you're experts in setting aside the commandments of God in order to keep the traditions, and he gives them an example. And the example hits them really hard. But it says there that uh, Jesus appeals to the, one of the Ten Commandments in verse 10 when he says, uh, for Mo Moses had said, honor your father and your mother, and uh, he who uh, speaks evil of father or mother is to be put to death. Now that's pretty significant. Those were elevated positions of honoring your father and mother that go all the way back to Exodus 20 and the giving of the law, starting there with the Ten Commandments. And Jesus is going to say to them, if a man says to his father and mother, whatever I have that would help you is korban, that is, it's given to God, you no longer permit him to do anything uh, for his father or his mother, thus invalidating the word of God by your tradition, which you have handed down, and you do many things such as that. When Jesus says to them, listen, you guys have become experts in dodging the word of God. They, they had become very clever. Jesus appeals to this whole idea of korban, and, and let me just give you a little bit of a synopsis on that. It was part of oral tradition that would allow you to declare something as a holy something. It could be your home, it could be your land, it could be all of your food. You, you declare, this is given unto God. Now, when you declared something as korban and given to God, you still had full control over it, all right? You still, you still fully controlled how it was, was used in every which way. And in the law, there were writings as to try to interpret just this scenario where someone had parents who were needy people. They had financial needs. And it's like, well, mom and dad, I mean, I'd help you out, but you know, I declared my bank account korban. And so I really can't do anything because it's all dedicated to God. So 
they look this over very carefully and realize, the Jewish leaders realize, that this could be manipulated. And so they would usually side, for instance, with the law and say, no, you are exempt from that and you should help them. But there was this real extreme group that is traced through history that was evidently something that Jesus was aware of and it was alive and well at Jesus' time. They would have these scribal uh, councils where you would go in and see if you could lift the korban. But most of the time, they would not let you lift the korban. So if it was declared, you know, hey, I'm sorry, I, I can't really help you out. It's, it's all God's. That was all great, but it was being used to manipulate things. The point is this. They were taking in a very clever way, their traditions, and making the Bible irrelevant for them. They were finding ways around it. They'd become experts in avoiding the Scripture. Now, if we want to be painfully honest with ourselves today, we would have to say that we oftentimes duplicate the same type of shenanigans. Uh, We oftentimes will approach the Bible And we'll look at what the scripture says. And we'll think of ways that we can get around it. It's funny, as time has gone on, uh, so much has changed um, in the pastorate. I know things have changed a a great deal. Uh, People would come, they'd ask you questions, and you'd defend what it was from the scripture, and you'd say, here it is. And, And it's funny, because now it's a lot easier, because the burden is on people who are trying to kind of do what we just got through reading. It's kind of like, well, this is what the Bible says. You can read it in plain English. It's a good translation. You tell me how you're going to get around this. The burden's on you. The burden's on, not on me to try to explain it. There it is. This is what the Bible says. It says dot, 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 dot. How are you going to deal with that? You see, the burden's on us, isn't it? And we look at Scripture, and so many times we're willing to, to take that big shark sign that we see, and figure out a way around it. How how are we not going to get bit by the shark? You see, we can go in there. We can do it. We take the word of God and we we tilt things a little bit so it's more to our liking. Notice here, thirdly, that there's the application in verses 14 through 23. um, Really here, of abiding by God's standard of righteousness. In verse 14, Jesus is going to call the crowd to him again. So the disciples have been a kind of accosted by this group of religious leaders. He's settled them down by, by reading them scripture, calling them hypocrites, which was pretty significant. And then in verse 14, he calls the crowd and he says, listen to me, all of you, who, and understand, there is nothing outside the man which can defile him if it goes into him, but the things which proceed out of the man are what defile the man. If anyone has ears to hear, let him hear. And when he had left the crowd and entered the house, his disciples questioned him, and he said, are you so lacking in understanding also? Do you not understand that whatever goes into the man from outside cannot defile him because it does not go into his heart, but it goes into his stomach and it's eliminated? Now, that's a pretty straightforward way of teaching. There is absolutely nothing. Listen, Pharisees, there's nothing that I can eat, whether with purified hands or dirty hands, that will defile my heart because the food never goes into my heart. Jesus says it goes into my stomach. When I had physiology class in ninth grade, I remember my teacher going to the blackboard and saying, it's very simple, folks. And he drew a picture of a cylinder. I still remember how he did that. I've tried to do that a number of times. It was really pretty cool. And he said, we're a cylinder, and we're a cylinder within a cylinder. He says, that's all you really need to know, and that's all I really needed to memorize, and that's all I do remember. (laughs) Then Jesus is teaching this, and Jesus says, look, You can't defile yourself with food that goes into your stomach. You know, I got reading that this week, and I got thinking about it. 
And, and I started thinking about this, and I thought, you know, <laughs> there is absolutely nothing that I can eat that will defile my heart. I need that water. See, you come to church, you learn all kinds of things, right? You can run right out there and grab those donuts and eat those donuts ahead of time. It's fine. I can eat this. That's not my problem. My problem is not with my stomach. Now, if I ate too many of these, I might have a problem with my stomach. And there's a good chance in 40 years it'll still be in my stomach. There is something not right with these. But it hasn't defiled me. That's the key. What Jesus looks at here, pardon me for preaching with my mouth full. It has nothing to do with my desire. I want to get rid of it. I want it to be eliminated. But it's sticking. Notice what Jesus says. Here's what our problem is. He says, that which proceeds out of the man, that is what defiles the man. What comes out. Not what goes in. What comes out of our life? What is, what is the product of my heart? You see, the product of your heart is demonstrated by how you live. It's certainly by the things that you say, by the things even that you think, according to what Jesus is teaching us here, even the things that you think are a byproduct of your defiled heart. Not your defiled stomach. You can't defile the stomach. Jesus goes on and he lifts this. He says, for from within, out of the heart of men proceed, and he says, evil thoughts. Well, evil thoughts kind of encompass everything, don't they? Uh, Out of our heart come these evil thoughts, and it doesn't end there. The next thing he says is fornication. Uh, That's the word that we get the the word pornography from. It's a very broad term, uh, but it certainly speaks of all types of uh, sexual impurities that are going to flow out of a person. The next word uh, is the word theft. Uh, We get the English word kleptomania from that Greek word. There are all these part and parcel to the heart of the unregenerate person. Every one of us is a sinner. Every one of us has a sin nature, and it's out of that sin nature, that sin-affected heart, that all of these wicked things come from. That's my problem. That's your problem. The problem isn't with purifying our hands. We can do all kinds of external things. In fact, external things are great because external things are easy to do compared to dealing with our heart. Would you agree with that? Wouldn't it be great? I mean, the elders, we're going to get together after church. We're going to have 10 things that if you obey these 10 things, we're going to just stamp you as righteous. Isn't that great? And uh, one of them is, you know, you drink one or more cups of coffee every day. You say, oh, that's great. I can do that. Or substitute for tea. Um, uh, You know, one Twinkie a year. Oh, yeah, that's all. Uh, We we could have a whole bunch of things that we do that are external things that don't even touch our heart. That's the point that Jesus is trying to make. He's trying to tell us a couple of things here. He's trying to tell us, first and foremost, we have a problem with our heart, and the heart needs to be addressed. Because all of this evil flows out of our heart. All these evil things, he says, proceed from within and defile the man. Jeremiah was right. The heart is deceitful above all things and desperately wicked. Jesus would look at these hearts of men and realize that they had tremendous spiritual needs. And every single one of us has a tremendous spiritual need here today. Have your sins been forgiven? Have you come to Jesus, placed your faith in him? What proceeds out of a man tells the story, doesn't it? What are your thoughts like? What's your thought life like? Ooh, you say, man, I'm glad it's, it's in my head and not anywhere else. Yeah, you're right. We're all glad that's true. But God sees all of us, doesn't he? He sees us down in the depths of our soul and he knows exactly what's in our heart. He knows the deeds of our flesh. He sees all of the deeds of our flesh. He sees all of those things that defile a man. 
And the only way that we can have a clean heart is by placing our faith in Jesus Christ. Great passage in Ezekiel. God says to his people, he says, if they return to him, and he says, I'll sprinkle you uh, with clean water. You'll be clean. I'll cleanse you from all your filthiness and from your idols. Moreover, I'll give you a new heart and a new spirit will be placed within you. That's what we need, isn't it true? We need a clean heart. We have a heart problem. We need to clean that heart up. And we can't do it by external means. There's nothing that we can do uh, to bring about the cleansing of our heart. The only way that's possible is through the promised Messiah, Jesus the Christ. And Ezekiel, he says, I'll remove the heart of stone from your flesh, give you a heart of flesh, and I'll put my spirit within you, cause you to walk in my statutes. And you'll be careful to observe my ordinances. You're going to be a changed people. In fact, you'll be so changed that the noticeable difference will be what starts to flow out of your life. I think of the time that the water company comes. And if you have public water, you know how this is. They'll put up t signs and say, we're testing the water or we're clearing the pipes. Have you ever had that happen? And they tell you to run the water. Before you use it, after they're done, you turn the water on. What comes out? Brown water usually, right? It's got sediment in it and silt and junk, and you let that run for a few minutes, and what happens? It clears itself right up. It's nice, clean water again. That's a perfect example, isn't it, of how we live our life before we come to faith in Christ. But afterwards, our life is to show forth fruit of salvation and that's why he says in Galatians, the fruit of the Spirit is love, joy, peace, all those good things. That's what God wants to do. He wants to change our heart so that we have a clean heart that pours forth blessings uh, that are out there in this world and blessings unto Jesus. Titus chapter 3, he saved us not on the basis of deeds, which we have done in righteousness, but according to his mercy, by the washing of regeneration and the renewing of the Holy Spirit. This is what God's plan is to deal with these defiled hearts that we've been born with he poured upon us richly jesus christ our savior so that being justified by his grace we'd be made heirs according to the hope of eternal life that's great promises isn't it wonderful promise some things for us to think about we're not required to observe the regulations of a religion but we are required to adhere to the word of god the Word of God needs to be supreme in our hearts and minds. We need to be honest with ourselves when we're trying to figure out ways to avoid what the Scripture says. Let's not be like the Pharisees and trying to dodge it by coming up with creative ways to circumvent the Word. But let's look at it and let's seek to obey it. As a church, we need to focus on the Word of God and never on tradition, especially if we would elevate tradition in practicality above the word of God. And again, every single church that I've ever been a part of would always say we're Bible preaching church and we'd never exalt tradition above the word. And yet, time after time, there are certain things that are part and parcel to every church that we hold dear, that sacred cow, as it were, that has elevated itself. And we need to be careful about that. And lastly, God is concerned with our spiritual condition. It's a subject that only you and the Lord can address in your life. Will you be honest with yourself? Will you see yourself as God sees us? I have to be honest with myself. God sees me clearly. He knows my heart. What does that do in practicality? Maybe God's working on your heart today to place your faith in Christ. Maybe if you're here as a follower of his already, he's seeking to teach us about our heart because we know that that's the most important thing to God. Let's pray. If you're here this morning and you've never placed your faith in Christ, in a moment I'm going to pray and I hope that you'll pray too call on the name of the Lord for salvation. If you're here this morning and you've already made that decision to trust Christ, that's wonderful. But would you get serious about looking at your heart? It's easy to put on a show. 
That's what the Pharisees were good at. But all the while, God knew their heart. And Jesus exposed their heart for what it truly was. He sees us and he knows us. What will you do with that reality? Father in heaven, we thank you that you have given to us an opportunity today. An opportunity, Lord, whereby we can place our faith in the true Savior, Jesus the Christ. We can have faith in you and know that our sins are forgiven. We've received eternal life through our Savior alone. Work in our hearts today. Help us, Father, as well to be mindful of our heart, knowing, Lord, that you desire for us to display the fruit of the Spirit. May your church, Lord, rise up and live as you desire for us to live. We pray all this now in Christ's name. Amen. Just a couple of announcements here this morning. Uh, one is that uh, I'm looking for guys to come to the dinner tomorrow night. And so it's great food. We have a guest speaker. should be awesome. Uh, that's tomorrow night. Uh, come around 6.30 if you want. We'll probably kick it off with prayer and start eating at 7. There's a sign-up sheet on the back table just outside the double doors. So you can check that out uh, if you can come. I've ordered enough for 50, and I have 26. So we're going to be eating well. Um, but seriously, I, I, I'm looking for another 25 to sign up. So uh, please, please, please sign up. Also, there's a couple other things that are going on. There's the men's retreat. You need to be thinking about that now. The window on that closes usually mid-October, and so uh, be thinking about that if you would. And men's fraternity itself uh, will be doing the last one of our six segments. We'll be doing the last one this fall, and so you want to sign up for that. That starts two weeks from uh, tomorrow, so or a week from tomorrow, rather. So you keep that in mind. Also, October the 7th is an all-prayer time here at the church on that Sunday night. You want to be aware of that. As I mentioned in the first service, we have uh, uh, Joel and Katie Reyes that have uh, joined here at Faith Community Church. If you see them, uh, tell them uh, welcome, right? Are you guys here? I don't know if I saw you. Oh, Katie's here. Katie, you have to stand up. Joel stood in the first service. Yeah, yeah, great. Welcome, welcome. I'm glad I asked. That's great. That's great. You may have seen Katie. She was baptized here not too long ago, so uh, that's just awesome. Uh, we're excited for, uh, for them. Let's all stand. We'll have a word of prayer, and uh, we'll remember to uh, keep in prayer our missionary of the week, Dean Collar, uh, and uh, ask the Lord to, to bless in his travels and as he spreads the gospel as well. Father, again, we thank you that we can come and be a part uh, of worshiping you. Lord, help us not to worship you with our lips. But Father, help us to, to give our heart to you fully, holding nothing back, Lord, uh, that we would truly uh, bring you glory. Uh, we thank you, Father, for opportunities to share our faith. We pray, Lord, in the week ahead that um, we would look for those opportunities and that we would uh, take advantage of those that come our way. Uh, Lord, uh, we are just so thankful as people uh, for the saving work of Jesus Christ. And we thank you, Father, for uh, our brother Dean Collar and his family. And we just pray, lifting up uh, Dean, Lord, even though he can't see physically, Lord, uh, we thank you that he can see spiritually. And that, Lord, you're using him around this world. And we just pray your continued hand would be upon him uh, for good health, safe travels, and uh, the heart uh, of desire to keep on serving you. So we thank you, Father, for all these things, and pray your blessing on the week ahead. And we ask it all in Christ's name. Amen. Amen. God bless you.